Welcome to GradCast, the official podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. GradCast is the official radio show and podcast of the Society of Graduate Students here at Western University. I'm your host, Alex Mozinski, and I'm joined by Ramina Adam. How are you, Ramina? Pretty good. How are you? Pretty good. It feels like forever since the last time we co-hosted together. I know. I can't it's remember been a long time. doing it ever in the booth here, and I can't remember the last time we co-hosted a podcast together. And it's all science. The two scientists are back. Science <laughs> rules. Just like the yeah. line. <laughs> science rules. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, it's good to have you back. Thank it's you. It's good to be back with you. Um, so today we're joined by Jeremy Visco. Uh, hi, Jeremy. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our home. Oh, it's very um, nice. <laughs> it's very nice in this booth. <laughs> um, so Jeremy is a Master's of Science candidate supervised by Stuart Fogel and Adrian Owen. Yes, this is true. So Adrian is the consciousness specialist, and then th in the Owen lab, there's also the sleep lab, which studies, obviously, sleep and in the consciousness of that kind of state as well as sleep and memory. Yeah. So I'm in the sleep lab predominantly. My, my focus is definitely on the sleep aspect. Does Adrian Owen's lab, like is Stuart Fogel's lab under? Adrian yeah, Owen's yeah, lab? it's okay. part of it. Oh, so okay. we're kind of our own little huge. sub kind of group within, within Adrian's lab. Yeah. Awesome. The Owen lab is huge from <laughs> what I understand. <laughs> There's many of us. Yeah. Yes, small army. <laughs> Look at the website and it's just like, it, it is an army. It's just like it keeps going. And yes. Where are you? You're the second member of the lab to come on, if I recall. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Steve was on Steve like on, yeah. last week, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. It was a while ago. Locked I'm in with Stephen Buchanan. <laughs> I believe it's yeah. like grad class number 23. <laughs> Check it out. Um, I really hope that the Adrian Owen lab has like a sleep nap room. That's like all I picture. That would be amazing. Well, there, there's three. There's three bedrooms, and I may or may not have used them on occasion <laughs> during a long, <laughs> tough week stretch. Uh. That is awesome. <laughs> I am visiting or collaborating somehow right. with that lab. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have some perks, you know. Oh, yeah. So you study sleep. Sleep is is very important to all of us. I'm sure some of us are hopefully experts at doing it. Um, we spend about a third of our lives sleeping. So what can you tell us just preliminary about sleep, its function, what it does, and, and why you're studying? Right. So that's the big question, actually, is what, what does sleep do if it's for something we spend so much time in? And the answer is we don't really know yet, and that's part of why we're studying it. But there's some theories. There's a couple theories out there. Um, some of the main ones have to do with how sleep consolidates memories. So when I say consolidate, I mean it enhances learned information and makes it stronger, more durable, so that if you learn something, you can kind of freely recall it in an adaptive way. Um, other theories include that it, that it helps you recover, and it's, it's a rest time for your brain and body, so you can get rid of any metabolites or the byproducts that your brain uses. You know, it's like when you, during the day, your, your brain's going, and it kind of has a lot of extra products it kind of makes to running, like, kind of like brain exhaust, we'll call it, and then at some point you've got to clear that out so you're, you're refreshed in, in the morning. So that's another, another important uh, function of sleep, which, which people are looking into and understanding how that works. I focus on memory myself, so the theories of, yeah, how does sleep, in which stages of sleep, because there's different stages in sleep, how do they work to consolidate different types of memories? And uh, that's kind of where I where I work. Awesome. So if we don't sleep, would we die? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh even, uh, not even after like a week, I think, right? No, no. The th sleep is so fundamental that you won't die from it if you don't get it, you, but you will just go to sleep. At a certain point, your brain will literally just say like, you, you know what, I'm taking control of this situation. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're doing, but you better go to sleep now and you'll like, your brain will shut off and you're going to hit sleep. I don't know what the record is until it happens, but it's, you can go days it's and days. I like think there's like 11 days? Yeah, there's yeah. I saw this, the one kid who did that and it just like, kept like a diary of like how he felt. Yeah, like it wreaks havoc noise. on oh, your yeah. body and brain and you can have like hallucinations and it's like, it's really bad for like your, your immune system. Also, it's just not good. Get some sleep. <laughs> I could have sworn that there was Let's like just do it. a case where someone had some sort of form of brain damage where their brain actually was unable to fall back asleep and he only lived about 12 or 13 days before he died. Well, th there is sleeping sicknesses which can do that, but that, I mean, is that because of lack of sleep or is that because of other secondary things? That's not true, but yeah, it's, 
you'll die of other things. If you're not getting yeah. enough sleep in the, in the long run, you will, it'll cause enough problems and, and Cause you're also like die something. You, yeah, you can't go like a day or two without hearing uh, some story about how sleep deprivation is causing like debt, like it's linked to like all sorts of medical issues like yeah. diabetes and like um, a lot of cardiac and, like, cardiac problems cardiac yeah. problems and and then just if you're just in interacting with the environment right if you're driving sleep deprived you're at a huge risk for accidents and yeah, yeah. so that's awesome you mentioned uh, stages of sleep so what do you mean because there's there's like you know, REM and non-REM sleep and then but there's more than just that so can you go through a little bit of what would happen over a normal person's right. average night's sleep. So what happens when, yeah, over the course of a night. So as you said before, there's non-REM and REM sleep. So how it, kinda, how it breaks down most easily is there's four stages of sleep. There's stage one, two, three. The third stage is called slow wave sleep. And then there's REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. So to help me kind of explain this, um, I guess I could use an analogy here. So think of watching a movie, right? It's all these frames. They're actually, it seems continuous, but it's just really fast frames. So let's equate that to being like conscious and awake. And so what happens when you go f through the first three stages of sleep is the frame rate of this movie of the reality starts to slow down and your brain starts slowing down until it's less of like a movie and more of like a slideshow presentation. So it's no, no wonder you're kind of unconscious when your brain starts slowing down. And the question then is, what do we get out of your brain slowing down and reducing frame rate? Um, the answer is that when your brain is doing that, then it can be in sync with itself, right? If everything's kind of off and on, which is what happens in slow wave sleep, you have really high amplitude brain fluctuations. Your brain is going like off and on at like one sample per second, essentially, or roughly that. And so what that does is it, it gives your brain an opportunity to talk to itself. Think of like using walkie-talkies. You've got to be on the same frequency to talk to somebody. And if your brain slows down, in this way, then you can have parts of your brain communicate both long and far and kind of talk to itself. What happened that day? How do we organize the information that we learned during the day? And that's, again, part of this consolidation theory and how, how that might happen. Um, and then the fourth stage is the REM sleep stage, a rapid eye movement, like I said. And it's called that because during this state, your eyes are moving back and forth. And it's your most vivid dream state. So you actually dream in all the stages, but your REM dreams are those really vivid perceptual ones that you really believe are real and there's a lot of like auditory and visual components to it. So between those four stages you cycle every night, roughly every 90 minutes through them throughout the night and so you get about five to seven cycles where you're going stage one, stage two, stage three, REM and then it resets. So that's that's the that's the basic kind of pattern it does and then there's another little kind of interesting thing that happens though it's the the first couple cycles of your of your sleep cycle they contain a lot more of that slow wave sleep i was talking about where your brain really slows down it's your really deep sleep and as you cycle throughout the night you actually start trading off you get less of the slow wave sleep and more of the rem sleep and that's why typically a lot of people wake up out of dreams so that's the basic sleep physiology 101 <laughs> So where does memory consolidation come in during your sleep cycle? Is there a specific um, stage where you do memory consolidation? I mean, like when I think of REM sleep and dreaming, a lot of the times my dreams will be weird mixtures of stuff that's happened during the day. So I'm wondering if it's like trying to consolidate my day's memories during REM sleep and then it all gets contorted and weird. Right, <laughs> right. So that that is the big question. That's what the majority of, of basic sleep scientists are looking at is what is why do we have these stages and does one particular stage help consolidate one type of memory and that's something that my thesis looks at as well and we don't exactly know it seems that some stages of sleep do help facilitate uh, making memories stronger for for certain types of memories for example in stage two sleep there's there's events called sleep spindles and they're they're really correlated with your ability to retain spatial information, right? So like navigating through a city, if you, if you just move to a new city and you're trying to find your way around, the sleep afterwards, you'll have a lot more spindles and then you're actually gonna be, have that stuff memorized better in the morning. So there's, there's, there's certain associations, but it's, it really overall, it's, it's very unclear and we don't know even why it would be the case that some stages do certain types of memories versus others. And as for, as for the REM, that's like one of the biggest mysteries of all. Still, we really don't know 
why we have REM sleep. Because if you're on some medications, you, you will not get any REM sleep at all. So SSRIs, some antidepressants, you get no REM sleep, yet there's no memory deficits associated. So it's like, why do we, why do we have that? Are there other deficits associated with that? With, with taking that medications like that? non-memory deficits, yeah. Um, I'm not, I can't really speak to that. I don't know the pharmacology that well, but certain med medications certainly do affect sleep in different ways, and they do have other predictable um, effects. If, they, if it messes with your sleep a lot, you typically have other memory or just like uh, vigilance problems from not getting good sleep. Some, yeah, some medication will interfere with just your natural sleep, but that the antidepressant and the no REM at all is still something that baffles scientists to this day. Like, how can they... Why do we have REM if <laughs> people can like completely survive without it? So we don't exactly know why REM. One question I had, and actually just a comment about the the pharmacology aspect. Is sure. What I find really cool about sleep-inducing medications is that some of them can be used for like a sleep maintenance insomnia, and they'll stay in your system like all night and help you stay asleep. Right. And then others can help you fall asleep, but then clear the system relatively fast, and then you can get a more normal. Night then sleep. yeah. So that's kind of cool. I I always thought that was interesting anyway. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. There was actually a study, I wish I remember which group did it, but they were actually looking at sleep in schizophrenic patients, and they were using GABA medicine, which is it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so they were using things that increased GABA. And the interesting thing about GABA, actually you get GABAergic mechanisms when you're drinking alcohol, that's actually GABA, GABAergic <laughs> mechanism, and it's a, it's a depressant. But they found that giving gabinergic medicine to schizophrenics, it actually fixed their sleep spindle. Schizophrenics have strange sleep spindle activity, and gabinergic, sleep spindles are be known to be like gabinergic, so we're just going to keep throwing that. Sorry, to be the lay person in here, can you define the sleep spindles? So, yeah, I guess it's, <laughs> I can draw them really well, but it's kind of hard to describe over the radio. So sleep spindles, uh, it's a, Ooh, how do you how do you describe that I without? Guess before we get into trying to describe what it is, how do you measure sleep in a person? So like when yeah, that's, 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 that'll help. Subject that okay. comes into your sleep lab, and what is the output that you're going to be looking at? Uh, and right. then from there, let's go on to, <laughs> to define things. Sure, I'll just I'll just finish off that the the schizophrenia thing now. Yeah. Anyway, so anyway, it, th this gabinergic stuff fixed this event in sleep, and then it relieved the schizophrenics of their uh, memory deficit. So it's interesting that you can get these bizarre you know, pharmalo pharmacological effects in sleep. Anyway, okay, yes. Sorry, let's just, I don't want to leave that as an open end there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess to, for, to further Christian, uh, Tristan's question, yes. um, so if I was a, a patient coming into a sleep lab or a subject coming mm -hmm. for one of your studies, well, what can you tell me about what's going to happen to me? Um, right, so study, to you walk you through. Yeah. So in order to study sleep, which is a, a global brain state, we use uh, what's called EEG electrodes, which are just little little gold cups we put on the on the scalp. And what these do is they pick up the bulk electrical activity. Your your brain is run on essentially like electrochemical activity, and you can you can measure brain waves through these scalp electrodes. So when somebody comes into the lab, we hook about 10 to 16 of these cups, we just kind of paste them on their head, and then we can get this reading of what their brain is doing, the electrical activity that's ongoing. And so in this way, we can see when they're in a different stage of sleep, we're going to see different kind of brainwave activity for that state. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. All right, so you're getting these, these electrodes, they're measuring the electrical activity, um, and so there's what you you, uh, you mentioned were sort of like oscillations that happen, right? So uh, your brain activity right now presumably is relatively fast because there's all sorts yeah. of things going it's on. Yeah, fast and very low voltage. It's really erratic. Mm -hmm. So the more asleep you get, the slower those oscillations become. Yes. Uh, and the more synchronized all the neurons in your in your cortex and I guess your thalamus and other brain structures yes. start to fire together. Um, and that measures as, as higher amplitude and slower waves. Yeah, so it's essentially it slows down, but it gets more powerful. It's like mm -hmm. instead of having like a... a like a playground swing, shake it in the wind, that's when you start to like push it back and forth, you know, it kind of gains momentum and it's the oscillation or the back and forth of the swing is, it's, it's bigger, <laughs> bigger and slower. So that's happening on the EEG. Or the uh, right, so we can see the brain waves doing that yeah. slowdown. Um, so the spindle is seen on the same output, so what, what 
is the spin? What does it look like? I guess. So okay, so again, it's kind of hard to yeah. describe or a squiggly what line. What does it mean? What does what it mean? Does okay, that's a good. Yeah. <laughs> As I was saying before, it's it's about oscillations and synchrony. So a sleep spindle is just this really synchronous burst of activity. And I, it's 10 to 12 hertz, and it's kind of hard to imagine a hertz, which is just like a cycle per second. So it's a small burst of up and down activity that really stands out on the, on the brainwave recording. And what that is, is it's, it's parts of your brain talking to itself. So it's when your brain is sending a signal from the thalamus, which is a kind of an upper midbrain structure, it's what your cortex sits on. When you get a sleep spindle, it's your thalamus, that, that structure of the brain talking to part of your cortex. So it's relaying messages back and forth. And that's why it's called a spindle. It kind of like winds up and it shoots this message back and forth. And that's what that synchronous activity is. And we think that's really important for memory consolidation because it is two parts of your brain syncing up and talking to each other. And that's presumably why it's associated with memory consolidation. Right. Just to like throw a wrench into, because I know this is also like a really gray area as far as knowledge yeah. as it goes. So then where do dreams fit in this? <laughs> so... If you're looking at like the EEG, like I said, you're going to see all this brain activity, and that's just it. Your brain is still active during sleep. It's, it's not dormant and just shut off. Your brain is really busy during sleep, and presumably a lot of this is it's replaying activity from, from your day, right? So it's replaying and reactivating things. So a hypothesis is that dreams are part of that, that replay, but because you're shut out from the, from the external world while you're in sleep, your brain can kind of mash up in what order it wants to you know, consolidate these things and where to put them in your cortex. So that's one hypothesis of why dreams really make no sense, but they kind of do. It's because it's your brain is doing its own thing and it's trying to organize these memories and make them stronger and, and you know, and package and parcel them and put them in the right place. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a cool side effect of the clean-up job that your brain's doing. Yeah, so that's really another theory. It's just like this, what's called an epiphenomenon. It just happens. It's just a side product of your, your brain doing other things. Pretty cool. Yeah. So that's one theory. But the title others. of your thesis is Sleep's Role in the Consolidation of Spatial-Centric but Not Motor-Centric Representations of Implicitly Learned Complex Motor Sequences. <laughs> that so definitely sounds like a, uh, sounds a thesis it title. Sounds uh, awesome. Yeah, so I, can, I can break that down. Yeah, so <laughs> what... what so you're looking at very specific elements of sleep to do with consolidation. Mm -hmm. What what exactly? So you mentioned spatial centric versus motor centric learning. So what what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. So let me concentrate first on what I, what I'm talking about when I say implicit procedural uh, learning. Yeah, that's why I read the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a whole bunch that, that really we can cool. break down. So a lot of the world we interact with, we interact with it at an an unconscious or subconscious level. So let's say you're walking down the street, you're hearing all these sights, sounds, and smells, and you're seeing cars go by, but your brain's still working and picking up information and extracting statistical probabilities. Like, what kind of cars? What, is there, like, more red cars today? Or, I mean, you're not consciously learning this stuff, but your brain is still working on it and, and doing these things. And that's one example of unconscious learning. Another one is procedural, like, motor memories where you're learning to do something, you're not explicitly telling your body where to go or what to do, but your brain is also optimizing this kind of relationship. So it's just when you practice something, for example. Yeah, if you have to, you know, practice like a, a layup in basketball, you can't really explicitly describe it, but you're going to keep working on it, and you're unconsciously learning where to position your body and, and how to do it and, your, and how to optimize your goal. So that's, those are examples of implicit learning. And so a lot of studies have been done on explicit learning when you're actually actively learning something like math or how to navigate again like a city or or something like that but the question is they, there's a lot of research that's explored that but then how do we store this unconsciously learned knowledge is it in the same way as explicit knowledge and then then the, the farther question that I'm interested in is then with these how we store this unconscious knowledge what does sleep do to it does it do the same thing? Does it also enhance this, this knowledge and consolidate it like it does for explicit memories? And so what I'm looking at in my thesis to avoid that really overly complex <laughs> title is that what representations do we get when we unconsciously learn something? And does sleep, does it consolidate one type of representation over the other? And so when I'm talking about spatial or motor, to use a little more common wording, I'm talking about when you learn something, you've got a motor memory for it, and you've also got a spatial understanding of what to do, regardless of where your body is or if your body's involved. 
So you actually get two simultaneous things when you're using your visual motor learning. And my hypothesis is that sleep is only consolidating that spatial representation, that spatial understanding, regardless of your body. That's, your brain has that information separate from your muscle memory. And so presumably it's sleep is only working on the one representation, not the other one. So what kind of studies do you do for that? The, 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 okay, you're lining up your question. So where did okay. you Sorry. get, and then we can go there, but where did sure. you get this idea from? Like, why do you think that it's just... Why do you think that it's just uh, consolidating the spatial representations and not the motor? Great. Uh, that's a, a perfect question. So there was another finding that my, <laughs> my study looks to uh, explain. It's this, it's a fairly reliable finding that when you, before bed, you're going to bed and you're trying to problem solve and you don't really, you're trying to figure something else and you sleep on it, the answer is kind of there in the morning, right? It's like sleep inspires this insight. So that's kind of a question that I wanted to answer is wh what is making this happen? Why are we more aware of something after we sleep on it? And so this ties right back into what I was saying where I think it's this this spatial representation that's consolidated and that's what that's the consolidation of that representation in those networks getting stronger that's what makes you more aware in the morning is sleep has really made that relationship that spatial relationship more ap apparent and accessible to you and then you can put it together. So I can't just like learn how to play volleyball or like start learning and then go to bed and wake up being an expert. <laughs> well, no, <Right? laughs> I think it'd take a couple, a couple games and you a couple know sleeps. Where the court is, but not how to. Play. Yeah, where your position is, but whether you could spike the ball or not, that's a different question, maybe. <laughs> Until you really master it, and then maybe we'll get some of that matrix stuff going on. Yeah. No kung fu. Um, <laughs> and that's a long ways off, and I know, <laughs> sadly. So. I also love, uh, as somebody who is in a relationship with a psychologist myself, you guys always think of the most interesting ways to study or to set up studies for these type of things. So could you tell us a little bit about how how you're manipulating your subjects? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can do that. So that sounds so evil. <laughs> manipulating your subjects. I'll tell you, but now I can't recruit on this radio show because they're all going to know my secrets. <laughs> but I'll give it a go anyway. So what I use, as I, s I said before, I do unconscious procedural uh, learning. So what I, what I do is I have people do this whack-a-mole type game before bed where there's four spots on a screen and they have four buttons that they use with their left hand and when this asterisk appears in one of these spots they have to click the corresponding button. And so you end up like chasing around this asterisk jumping between four places. But underlying where the, where the asterisk is going there's actually a pattern, a deterministic pattern. Of, it's 12 items. So it's kind of hard for people to just to pick out naturally. So they're actually unconsciously learning the sequence and learning to kind of anticipate where it will be. So as they're doing this kind of whack-a-mole thing, they're actually getting faster and faster without knowing why. And then I, after their training, I asked them, were you aware there's a sequence? Most people have said no so far, which is great. And then I asked them to recreate that sequence. And so they say they're not aware they learned a sequence, but when you ask them to recreate it, then they can actually do it. And so that's an example of unconscious learning. And the other little twist I put in, as I was saying before, I need to test whether it's how strong their spatial representation is versus their motor. I have them flip the keyboard upside down. So if you're doing it, if you're clicking the buttons on the top of a desk, I actually Velcro it with my high-tech lab Velcro. <laughs> I Velcro the keypad to the underside of the table. And then I can run a sequence that either keeps the finger order the same as when it was on the top, in which case on the screen the, the asterisk sequence will be backwards, like where it appears is going to be reversed, or I have it stay the same on the screen, but now their finger order will be reversed. So in one, in one way, when I'm testing their reaction times to see if they're getting faster, we're going to see, are they faster when I just keep the spatial but not the motor order of the sequence the same? Mm -hmm. Or are they faster when I keep the finger order the same even though now it's reversed on the screen? And so that's how I tap into see what, what representation have they really learned. Is it the finger, or like the motor, the motor memory of typing out the sequence, or is it on the screen that they're starting to learn? And then, of course, I retest them in the morning and hopefully see improvements. I haven't gone that far to the data yet, but yeah. So, is that so, they're, sense? so they're not necessarily getting the, the motor part, they're more getting the the spatial part from the screen? That's, how that's what it looks like, yeah, that spatial understanding. Cause, and I have looked at the pilot data, and it seems like yeah, people are better when I when I do this reverse manipulation, and they don't know. I haven't told them what they're doing. I'm just you react on the screen, click it as fast as you can. People are better, even though they're the finger order, the order of their finger pressing is reversed. 
and it's the same on the screen, that's what they're fastest at versus I keep their finger order the same and it's reversed on the screen. So people are absorbing the spatial information the fastest. Cool. So it's not like the actual finger order, which would be motor. Yeah, that muscle memory of the sequence is not, it, it seems to be not the first thing they learn. Presumably over time, if they kept doing it, that would increase as well, but mm -hmm. it really seems the brain engages with that spatial information the quickest. And I have to look at the, the post-sleep stuff, but ideally we would like to see that they're even better at that spatial after they've slept, but not that when I test them on the motor preserving sequence or the motor memory sequence. And so what does the EEG tell you? So, you re so they're doing this finger task and then they go to sleep and mm -hmm. while they're sleeping you, you record... So what do we look for in the sleep is, yeah. is what yeah. you're asking? Yeah. So we do a baseline night where they haven't learned anything and we're looking for increases in certain stages of sleep. So perhaps when you're learning unconsciously, it recruits more REM sleep. So we'll see an increase in, in REM, the amount of REM sleep from baseline, or other factors like how many sleep spindles did you get in your baseline versus now I've really trained you. Did this increase your sleep spindles? And that would presumably tell us a little bit whether sleep spindles have something to do with unconscious memory consolidation. Um, it's a bit exploratory because, I mean, it hasn't been done before. We think it might recruit REM, this, again, this mysterious state, so maybe that's what REM is doing is it's helping process unconscious knowledge. Uh, but it could just as easily be stage two, which we know is involved in spatial memory consolidation for explicit, like, explicit memories. We don't know if it's the same in, in uh, implicit memories. Um, so we look for increases and decreases in certain stages. How come you make them use the left hand? You mentioned it was the left oh, yeah. hand they have to use. Why? And are they all right-handed people who are doing this, or is it just whichever and it's always left hand? It's why I can never do psychological research. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually it's almost like a tradition more than anything now, unfortunately. Um, we get right-handed people because then they're left hemisphere dominant. So they say, and if you're left-handed, then people say you have different lateralization to your right hemisphere. So it, it's just a way of trying to control the population and kind of the brains of the people you're studying to have right-handed people, which are more common than left-handed people, and then use their non-dominant hand, which is their left hand, because it's, it's more, it takes more energy to learn with your non-dominant hand. So if we're looking for effects, we want to make sure that they're actually like engaged in, in difficult learning. People are too good with their right hand if mm -hmm. you're right-handed. Oh, okay. So it's, yeah, most studies kind of do that. It's, I'm sorry, left-handed people out there. <laughs> I know it's not fair. It's not a perfect world. So many $5 rewards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could have been so rich. <laughs> <laughs> so you have them come in for a baseline night first, and then you train them, and then they sleep. Yeah. And then you see how they did the next day. Yeah, that's, that's the, and I actually have them come in a week later just to see if that, that motor memory just increased over time as well. So if they were to do just a baseline and then like, I guess, a sham treatment and they didn't learn anything and then they came the second time, how much variability would we expect to see in either the REM stage uh, just amount of time and or the sleep spindles that we would be seeing? In right. The so that's the question that, like, I, I'm not sure yet. Um, but that, that sham that you're talking about is the control and actually have them do the task without a sequence underlying it. So they're really just pressing random buttons. So there's the same number of button one, button two, button three. So there is no learning, there's no underlying sequence, so then I get their sleep just doing the task without learning, and that's what I compare that control, that baseline night, to their actual experimental night. And again, I, I, I don't know quite yet what the sleep is, but I'm gonna be looking down, I'm definitely gonna be counting the spindles and looking at the, the percentage of REM, because those are the two most likely areas. And if it's more REM, that's gonna tell me one thing, and if it's more like stage two in spindles, that's going to also really inform my hypothesis and what's going on in the brain. So either whatever result I get, it's, I've, I have some some ways to interpret them, and because there's a lot of different frameworks people use and a lot of hypotheses out there, so whatever my results are, it's going to help to understand what the stage of sleep is doing. Yeah. Cool. Do you find that the reported quality of sleep is reduced in your subjects at all? Because, like, they're hooked up to wires and they're in a strange place. Like, <laughs> do they find that they're sleeping worse or better or anything like that? Uh, so there's this thing called the first night effect, which is well known in, in, in sleep research. And actually, we do a screening night first before even the control night and the experimental night where we have people come into lab. And, yeah, we come up with a lot of gear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of, like, stuff to check their respiratory to see if they have sleep apnea because we need healthy people. Um, 
And so that screening night also works for this first night effect. People don't sleep in a lab normally for their first night because it is a strange environment. And so when we do this screening night, we also check to see if they actually can sleep in the lab. So we kind of have a control measure for that. So yeah, once we see that in the screening night that they can sleep okay in the lab, and then they're, then they're just good to go for the rest of the study. I think that's an amazing idea because um, like a, a clinical sleep lab, that I don't know that they do that. So you just get a patient coming in, and you're trying to check their sleep. And you've got That's all for this week. If you want to send us some feedback, or if you want to come on the show yourself, email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. Be sure to hook us up on social media. On Twitter, we're at Gradcast Radio, and look up Gradcast Radio also on Facebook. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, the podcast is located at gradcast.podbean.com, and it's on iTunes. And while you're there, why don't you leave us a review? It really helps us out. We'll see you guys next week.